hard. And one of the things I like about the industry is just there's a lot of supply out there and not that many people who really know how to operate in the space or, or chasing it. So it's been kind of a fun, more lucrative niche for me. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. This is the podcast where we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. Well, my guest today has raised about $3 million for mortgage notes specifically over the past year, primarily raising that private money from individuals who are using their retirement accounts to um, invest in his notes and loan money on the notes. So anyway, my guest clients, they come to him because they want a no nonsense approach to note investing. And they want a step-by-step -step system that doesn't waste their time. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be talking about raising private money, investing in mortgage notes and all that kind of great stuff with my great guest and friend, Mr. Dan Dippen. And you're going to meet him right after this. Well, hey there, Dan. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jay. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I sure enjoyed being a guest on your show not too long ago. And after having that conversation with you, I said, man, we got to have Dan Deppin here on Raising Private Money. You've got wonderful experience in raising private money. We're going to dive into that as to how you like to go about raising private money. And then we're going to talk about your mortgage note investing, what that looks like. But before we dive into that, how about share your journey with the audience, Dan? Yeah. So for me, I started my career as an engineer in the aerospace industry. And then, you know, later went to business school, got into product management. And along the way, I found that I had most of my money in stocks and I wanted to diversify it into real estate. And so even back, you know, eight years ago or so in the Denver area where I am, cap rates and things for rentals were pretty tough. So I started looking around at alternatives and that was when I came across mortgage notes. And then once I found mortgage notes, I really went down that rabbit hole pretty hard. And one of the things I like about the industry is just, there's a lot of supply out there and not that many people who really know how to operate in the space or, or chasing it. So it's been kind of a fun, more lucrative niche for me. How did you get introduced to a mortgage note investing and what got you interested in doing it? I don't know if I recall exactly where I first found it. Um, I, I, I know I listened to a lot of podcasts. There was one called the, oh gosh, it was the, it was called like the note NBA. It hasn't been around for several years and then started following some of the groups online, um, you know, sort of following some of the folks like, like Dave Putz, who I'm still, you know, very close friends with. And then some other folks like Wayne Schnell, who were, you know, really, I would say like ahead of the industry eight, nine years ago, um, and are really good guys. And we're always good about, you know, sharing what they've learned. I got you. So let's first talk about how it is that you've gone around uh, and gone about raising private money. Here on this podcast, Raising Private Money, um, we've got two groups of people. We got one group of people that are looking to raise private money for their real estate deals. And then we got folks here that are tuning into the show that are interested in passive investing and just want to sit back and collect nice returns. So first, let's speak to people that are interested in raising private money for real estate, for their investments. So how did you get started raising private money? So I got started, you know, fairly early on. Um, I, I, I did some training with, with a guy at the time who, 
you know, kind of advocated raising private money. And my approach to it has always been that I play a very long game, right? Like I don't ever really try to raise private money directly. My long-term approach has just been, I've built my email list. I email my list regularly and I try to, and when I email my list, I, I'm basically sharing things that I've learned. So one of the things about notes is no longer, no matter how long you've done it, some of the individual deals, like you're, sometimes things get weird. You're always running into new things and always learning stuff. And so what I've done is just built an audience and then I share what I learned. So part of that's through the email list. And then I've also since set up a podcast and a YouTube channel. And I found that if I'm just sharing what I'm learning and what I'm up to, then people tend to reach out and then ask if I have any opportunities or things they can participate in. Uh, and then I kind of keep a separate list of people who are interested in investing and I want to get to know them a little bit and then eventually work with them. So it's a fairly uh, long process overall, but if you start early, then it's kind of always there for you. Well, Dan, you're doing the same thing I do and I'm doing the same thing you do. And that is we attract private money by being a teacher. So I've just mm -hmm. put on my private money teacher hat and that's what I do. I lead with this attitude. I lead with the uh, philosophy and the practice of just simply, as you said, you, you use the word sharing with people. I say teaching people what private money is, how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely, uh, how their uh, investment is um, a conservative investment, how it's secured, uh, backed by the real estate. And so you're doing the same thing. You know, I tell people all the time, number one, the worst time in the world to be trying to raise private money for real estate is when you need it for a deal, because after all, desperation has got a smell to it. And the easiest time to be attracting and raising private money is when there's no particular deal associated with it yet. And uh, it just takes the pressure, you know, off of everybody. I mean, these gurus, Dan, that are going around on stage saying, oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. <laughs> the money follows the deal. Dan, I want to throw up and go run head first into a real wall. That's the most stupid thing I ever heard in my life. It's like, Where's the money going to show up? Is it just going to like rain out of clouds or whatever, you know? And so, yes, I appreciate and I relate to your philosophy of raising private money. Uh, it's a longer term play. However, you know, sometimes people will want to invest right away in less than 30 days. But uh, myself, like you, no chasing, no begging, no selling, no persuading. Instead of asking for a mortgage, we're well, in my case, single family houses, we're offering a mortgage. Now, what I do, Dan, I want, I want to share with everyone what I do, and then I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. so when it comes to single family houses, I offer, of course, a promissory note uh, to, to, you know, to the, to the lender, the individual, the private lender. And I also secure their note, their promissory note when they're investing with the uh, mortgage or the deed of trust. So I'm collateralizing the note. So mm -hmm. what's the process look like when you have a private lender that's investing um, and, and, you know, and, and you're using the money for, for a note. Uh, is there, I mean, how is their money secure or what, what's the logistics look like? Yeah. So it, it's similar. And I would say too, that I don't know that no two people in the business do it exactly the same way. So I'll try to not get too far in the weeds, but, but the way that I do it. So I've got three documents that get created. There's a loan, there's a note, and then there's a security agreement. And so between those three, that's what gives the lender in this case for the hypothecated loan, their interest in the note. OK, and then I maintain the servicing on the note, actually. So the borrower will make payments. The payments go to the servicer. The servicers go to me. And then I pay out the investors. So that's one way to do it. 
Um, the, the other way that people do it, there, there are different ways to set up the paperwork. A lot of people, some people like to use collateral assignments. Um, some people will actually assign the note over to the lender. Um, th there's a lot of ways that you can do it. I like the way that I do it because it's a little bit cleaner from an admin perspective. So for my lenders, their interest is in being completely passive. And so they like having me to handle the day to day on the note because there are things that come up, especially if it's a land contract. Um, the other way that I set up my agreements and, and like the number one question I get from investors is what happens if the borrower defaults and it stops paying? And the way that I set it up, I'm on the hook to you know, take the loan through foreclosure if need be, or do any loss mitigation or whatnot. Now, while that's happening, payments to the borrower can can stop for the agreement. In, in reality, I just like to set up automatic ACHs because it just makes the whole thing easier. But they like that they have me to operate the note and then deal with things if the borrower defaults and there's a foreclosure. Other people will set them up where you know, basically, if there's a default, then the lender gets the note back. Or you can also set up the paperwork in such a way that the lender is actually ends up being required to hold the servicing. But now the lender's not really passive, right? Like they're more active. And so my theory of that has always been if the lender wants to be that active, then they don't really need me. They, they can just go out and buy the note and and work it themselves so that's kind of a long-winded way to say there's, there's a lot of different ways that that you can set that up right so just to be clear uh as with me in my case with my private lenders i'm my company is borrowing the private money i take that money and then i go invest in single family houses in your case you're not your company's not borrowing the money from private lenders to go invest in notes your uh, investors are actually investing directly in the notes themselves right yeah what so what i'm doing is i'm actually separating buying the note and then taking the loan from the investor so back to one of your like earlier points you were making about not having to run around and chase money. So when I find a note that I want to buy, I go out and buy it with my own funds first. So for mm -hmm. one thing, I keep a fair amount of cash on hand and I have some lines of credit. And so if I see a good deal, I can go out and buy it. Then once I've bought the note, then I go and find the funding. And so to me, it makes life a little bit easier just to break up those transactions and not have any dependencies where maybe I have to cause a delay for the note seller or I can't follow through on something because something happened where, you know, an investor didn't follow through when they said they were going to. But anyways, I, I, I buy the note first. And then what I offer the investor is a hypothecated loan. So I'm borrowing money from the investor at some fixed interest rate. And then the loan they're making to me is collateralized by the underlying note. And then that's where I use that loan agreement note and security agreement that um, uh, ties that collateral to, to their loan. Okay. Well, let's make sure everybody understands because you've said it twice. What do you mean by hypothecation or hypothecating? Yeah. So all I mean by that, is a loan secured by another loan. So instead of what you know, I believe you do or what most people do, where the, the private investor is making a loan that's secured by property, my investors are making loans to me, but it's secured by another loan. There you go. Hypothecation, one loan securing another loan. So how lucrative can this be um, this strategy for your investors? Yeah. So basically most of the time my investors are getting high single digit returns mm -hmm. and they're getting that passively. And so it's secured by a loan and 
for the most part these days, because property values have gone up so much, like a lot of the loans I've been buying were originated eight, 10 years ago. Right. So the borrower has a lot of equity in the property. They're, they're secured that way. They don't necessarily have upside beyond that, but they're getting a passive solid return. That's pretty protected. The other thing I do occasionally, I, I haven't been doing it as much lately, although I did two of them this year is sometimes I'll go out and buy non-performing loans and then I'll do joint ventures with investors. So when I do a joint venture with an investor, the investors putting up the money, I'm doing the majority of the work. And then when we get to an exit, it's so like a foreclosure sale or we get the loan reperforming and sell it, then the investor gets their funds back first. And then, and then we have a profit split depending on how that particular joint venture is set up. Gotcha. Um, typically, and I'm sure this may vary depending on the note, but typically how long will, your investors have their money invested in the note. Uh, and part two to that question is, is there a way they can get their money back in case of an emergency if they need their money back? Yeah. So, so the way I set these up is I just ask the investors to stay in the loan for a year or two, and then I'll cash them out. So as far as the term of the loan, they're often pretty long, right? So if the, trying to think of the easiest way to explain this. So, so the loan they're making me is collateralized by another loan, but the loan that I went out and bought that borrower is making payments, right? So that principal balance is going down. So as the borrower pays me back and as I pay back the investor, I've got to make sure that those two track in such a way that the investor is still fully collateralized, right? So for example, like, let's say there were only a couple of years left on the underlying loan. If I were to pay the, in my investor interest only, but my borrowers paying me down within well, their, their collaterals going away. So what I do is I set the term of the investor loan to match the underlying loan. And so they always track together. So in some cases, the loan agreement we have, you know, maybe set up to go 20 years, but that doesn't mean the investor has to stay in it for 20 years. I just ask them to stay in it for a year or two. And then if they need the money back, um, I can refinance them out. You know, the other thing I do a lot is sometimes I have had people that have had emergencies and, you know, because I generally keep, you know, a pretty fair amount of cash on hand and have other lines of credit. And most of these loans aren't, super large. So like if somebody needs their money back in a pinch, usually I'll just give it back to them right away. But generally I'm asking that they stay in the deal for at least a year or two. Um, in reality, a lot of people tend to stay in the loans until they get paid off. You know, I've got a lot of people in these that have been in them five, six years and they're just happy to collect the monthly payment. Sure. Well, and the fact of the matter is if they get paid off and they get their investment, the principal amount of their investment back, what are they going to do with it? Right. Where, where they've got to redeploy it. Yeah. Right. Where are they going to put it? You know? Um, and I mean, you know, when I have a new private lender and I'm getting ready to pay them off, uh, inevitably they'll say, well, Jay, can't you just keep the money? <laughs> Cause they know when they get the money back, they're not making money on their money. And, and with my case, no, I, I, I do not keep the money unless I've got an asset, you know, to collateralize. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure the audience is really interested in knowing where and how do you find these notes to invest in? You mentioned a few moments ago that sometimes you'll buy non-performing notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I, I guess you also invest in notes that are current and they are performing. So uh, how, how do you find these quote unquote, deals of notes that you can buy at a discount. Yeah. So, so it comes from a lot of different places. I'll try to keep it, you know, you know this one without, you know, I, I could nerd out for a long time on this. Um, primarily I'm buying through my network. So I built a pretty big network of investors and fund managers over the years. So a lot of them will come from other note investors who do what I do where maybe, you know, they had an investor that wanted to cash out for whatever reason, like we were just talking about, and, and they want to sell a few notes. 
uh, some of my best deals have come from smaller funds when they've run their course and are shutting down. Uh, you know, a lot of times when people set up note funds, they have an arrangement with their investors where the fund is going to run a certain number of years and then they're going to liquidate. You know, those are some of the best deals. If you don't have that network built up, um, there are a few online exchanges, although the one, you know, kind of serious one is paperstack.com. Uh, so a lot of investors will list loans for sale there too. There's a couple of right, reputable brokers out there um, that you can buy from, or uh, pretty soon you'll also be able to go to a place like uh, call the underwriter, which that's a whole nother discussion I can get into later, but they help uh, originators of seller finance notes. And then a lot of times those people originating the seller finance notes want to sell them. So there's a lot of different places you can go kind of, I, I would say it's, it's a little bit analogous to raising capital. It, it's easiest to, to buy notes if you play that long-term game and you build the network up over time. So like if you've built that network and you're known by those people as a reliable counterpart, it's one of the big things to know is like, there's just a lot of flaky people. There's a lot of bad buyer and seller behavior that can happen. But if you're known as a reliable buyer and you communicate your buy box to your network and then people know as long as there's nothing wrong, you're going to close that thing. Then a lot of times deals just kind of find me, right? Like someone will just contact me and say, Hey, I got an investor who wants to cash out. I have these two notes. Are you interested in them? So it's kind of similar to finding investors where there's not this gigantic liquid market, you know, amazon.com of notes where there's just always going to be something there to buy. You got to be a little bit opportunistic. So if someone is never been in this space before and they're interested, you know, in, in learning about it, um, and this may be too much of a in the weeds question. So if it is, keep it super simple <laughs> if you mm -hmm. can. But how does how do you go about calculating what's a good deal and what you should even offer on a note and what kind of discount should you go for? to make the math work. Yeah. So, so what I do is I look at the deal and I, and I assess the, what, what I consider the risk level of the deal. Right. And, and then I figure out like, okay, based on how risky I feel this is, what kind of a return would I need to justify that level of risk? And then from there, I look at all of my cash flows in cash flows out. And I back in uh, to what my price is going to be. Right. And so that kind of tells me like what I can pay for this thing. And then there's always a little bit of strategy around what do I actually offer? And then, you know, it also takes a little bit of time to get a feel of like what the market pricing is. Now, probably made that sound more complicated than, than it is. I've got some pretty simple spreadsheets that I use where I can zero in on pricing pretty quickly. And if you've done a lot of these, you know, it becomes a thing where um, you can get pretty fast at it. So, so generally the beginning note investor, and I know definitely for me, when I started, it would really take me like a long time to figure out pricing, to get through a due diligence process. But the good thing about notes or just loans in general, once you understand them at a deep level, they tend to be fairly rinse and repeat. And so you can dial in on those things pretty quickly, usually. Well, there's one thing about investing in notes. The rehab or renovation process is pretty simple because <laughs> there yeah. is no renovation. There are no rehabs, right? You're well, there could be. So, so here's, here's the catch. And now if you're buying like solidly performing notes, this shouldn't come into play, right? But if you're buying non-performing or every now and then you have one that gets weird, you know, you, you can end up having to foreclose and ending up with an REO. And, you know, depending on the condition, it could be tricky. So for the most part, I would say 95 plus percent of the time, 
the advantage of notes versus rentals is you don't really have to do everything with the property, but you'll get this subset of deals where it's like the worst nightmare, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you had, I, I had one earlier this year, borrower had been paying reliably for several, I think I owned the note for four or five years. And then the borrower passed away. And then the borrower was kind of a hoarder, you know, and I did get the, the property sold. I got it sold for a little more than I was owed. So, you know, it ultimately worked out, but it became a little more work and it got a little hairy for a little bit. So even on a performing note, stuff can happen sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Well, just based on what you said, if someone's interested in investing in the note business, it's just a whole lot simpler. For, the, for them to just invest with you and let you do all the calculating and let you do all the figuring and let you do all the negotiating. And they can just be a, um, a private lender or a private investor with you and, and sit back and just get those high single digit returns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for most of my investors, that's what they're content to do. I've also had a bunch of people who were interested in doing this themselves. And so they said, okay, I want to kind of fund some of your deals and ride along with you and look over your shoulder for a little bit, you know, and then they went off and did them on their own. Now, when people are investing with me, that's not a training program, right? Like that's not, you know, it's not like a mentorship or anything like that, but it is a way for people to get exposure to some deals and see all the details and see how at least I handle some of the decision-making on them. There you go. Well, speaking of exposure and getting introduced to this world, what's the best way for people to reach out to you, Dan, and find out how they can become involved? Yeah, best way is to go to my website, fusionnotes.com. So you can sign up for my email list there and I've got some other resources. And then you can also check out my YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash fusion notes. And so I've got a ton of videos that I've been posting on there for for several years, including some real, you know, deep dives on getting started and, and some other things on there. All right. Wonderful. So that website is www.fusionnotes.com spelled F as in farmer, F U S I O N notes, N O T E S.com fusionnotes.com. And again, Dan's YouTube channel is, um, I already forgot it. Say it again there. Dan. Oh yeah. YouTube.com oh. forward slash fusion notes. Very, very interesting, Dan. Uh, not too many people in this space. Uh, I'm in a couple of mastermind um, groups and I know uh, just a small handful of note investors in there. So yes, if you're listening to this show, be sure and reach out to Dan uh, and you can learn how to make some high rates of return um, totally passively just by investing with Dan. Dan, thank you so much for joining me on Raising Private Money today. Thanks for having me on, Jay. I appreciate it. You got it. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm so glad you decided to join us. If you happen to be listening on your favorite podcast platform, be sure and follow me so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to click that bell, subscribe, like and share so you don't miss out. I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.